Thank you, Kim. Good morning. We want to keep uh, Darlene Brinkheis and the family in our prayers as uh, they mourn the loss of Reverend James Brinkheis. His visitation will be this afternoon from 2 to 4, with a funeral tomorrow at 11 a.m., and a visitation an hour before. And now let us worship God by reading responsibly the call to worship. Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. Lord, you've changed my sadness into a joyful dance. I will not be silent. I will sing praises to you. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Let us pray. O Lord, as you appeared to Saul while he was bent on persecuting your followers, come to us as we too pursue those who do not believe as we do and ridicule those we seek peace in our time through the path of love. Blind us to the folly of our ways and make clear to us the path that you would have us follow that we may become true disciples of our Savior, Jesus. Amen. Our hymn of praise is hymn number 45. Sing praise to God who reigns above. Let us now confess our sins before Almighty God. Let us pray. Almighty God, we have been slow to recognize that you are the God of all nations, all people everywhere. We have been quick to criticize and slow to forgive. And now, hear our silent prayers of confession.
by your mercy, forgive our foolish ways. Help us to make amends. And by the power of the risen Christ, enable us to carry your message of salvation to those rejected by others. We pray this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Hear now the good news. God's anger lasts but for a moment, but God's favor lasts for a lifetime. The Lord forgives our shortcomings and sends deliverance through Christ, just as the Lord forgave Saul and used him to spread the gospel. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. Jesus said, I give you a new commandment, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Let us now go to God in prayer. Our gracious and heavenly Father, as we gather together on this third Sunday of Easter, we thank you that we can continue to celebrate your mighty outpouring of power in raising your Son, Jesus Christ, from the dead, especially after he went to the cross for our sin and our salvation. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that through the power of the resurrection, you not only give us that same hope of the resurrection, but you have made us your witnesses of that same resurrection. We thank you also for the pouring out of your Holy Spirit. We thank you for the Holy Spirit's work in our lives and in our ministries. And we are grateful, O oh Lord, that your same Holy Spirit has enabled us to profess our faith in Jesus Christ as our Lord and our Savior. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that you've gathered us together as a congregation in this place, that you've given us various gifts and talents that can be used in the ministry of your gospel. We pray that you will continue to be with the various ministries of our church. We pray for the Sunday school, the kingdom's kids. We pray for this kitchen fundraising. We pray that you will be with the Vacation Bible School, which comes up next month, and the food truck party, VBS, and pray that it may be a wonderful gathering of children and learning and growing in their faith and understanding. Oh Lord, we give you thanks for the rain that we received yesterday and pray that you will send that proper balance of rain and sunshine. We especially pray for our farmers as they plant their crops and pray that you will grant them an abundant harvest at the end of that season. For you are the source of all good things. Our gracious and heavenly Father, just as you have created us, and fearfully and wonderfully made us. We know that you have the power to heal those who are sick and infirmed. We pray for Everly Wheeler as she continues her recovery from surgery. For Randy Wirtsema as he continues his recovery. Likewise for Joyce Canigator. We uplift before you Emmett Stemper, for Marla Schrank as she continues her treatments, for Craig and Lois Block, Zach Voss, Lena Olivier, Aletha Stubbe, 
Mitchell Wagner, Kathy Gross Edelman, Jared Brinkheis Gross, Darla Gross, and others. We pray for our nursing home and assisted living residents, for Dwight and Bev Lemkiel, Herman Voss, Lyle Gurkin, Mabel Voss, and especially Bud Sloma. Lord, we know that you do not willingly grieve your children. Look with pity on the sorrows of the family of Reverend Jim Brinkheis, your servant. Strengthen them in patience. Comfort them with the memory of your goodness. Let your presence shine on them and give them your peace. Be especially with Darlene, Randy, Susan, Darla, and Joy, and their families as they deal with tomorrow's service for Jim. Lord, we thank you for the various gifts and talents you give your people. And we thank you that Jill and Ross are, have completed their studies and will be graduating next Saturday from South Dakota State University. We pray that you will enable them to use their energies for their neighbors in need and that they will use their talents and gifts in a spirit of love. Lord, we pray now that you will gather us together again next Sunday for our Sunday services. And we pray for the baccalaureate next Sunday evening. And for Reverend Steve DeHaan as he preaches your message, that you will grant him the wisdom and the insight he needs to speak to the graduates and send them on their way. Lord, just as you call the apostle Paul, when he was Saul, to not only change his life and to commit his life to the resurrected Christ, but that you also set him apart to be a witness to your resurrection, that you set him apart to be a minister of the gospel and to suffer for your name. We thank you that you have set apart Roland and Jane Vaness, Brad and Robin Coutts and Seapad as missionaries. We pray that you will be with them in their respective fields, that they too will be able to touch the hearts and lives of those people who need to hear the gospel message and to embrace Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. We continue to pray for the West Sioux classes and the churches that make up this body, for the regional center of the heartland, especially the leadership of Tom Smith. We pray for the Reformed Church in America, as we are about six weeks away from the General Synod meeting in Pella. We pray for President Phil Osink and Vice President Dwayne Jackson and for General Secretary Eddie Alleman and for all the delegates as they prepare for their arrivals. Pray for this nation in which we live. We pray that you will grant us unity and a common purpose, and that we may be able to discuss our differences in a civil manner. We pray for an end to the wildfires in the southwestern U.S., Arizona, New Mexico, and even western Nebraska. We pray for those who suffered damage or even injuries in the tornadoes in Andover, Kansas. We pray for this world in which we live. We pray for an end to the warfare in Ukraine. We especially pray for those who are trapped in the steel factory in Maripol. Pray for an end to the fighting in Tigray in Ethiopia. Cameroon and other war-torn lands. Bring down those who oppress their people. We especially think of the people of Myanmar. 
And now, Lord, teach us to pray as you taught your disciples to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us now return to God the offering of our life and the gifts of the earth. Give as you have made up your mind, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. 317, Love Lifted Me. Let us pray. O oh God, we lift it to you our songs of praise and thanksgiving. With this offering, we present ourselves to you, that we may proclaim with our lives that we are your children, and by our deeds, show your love for the world. Amen. At this time, Margot will give the children's message. The children would join me up front, that would be great.
Good morning. Boys and girls, I'm going to show you this morning a picture of a transformer, a transformer robot. And I imagine that most of you know more about transformers than I. The original transformers gave you the power to change the robot into a car or an airplane or a boat. And they became so popular that transformers were used in television, on advertisements, and on, in comics. But the transformer is a toy. It doesn't have any power. But there is a real transformer. And that transformer is Jesus. And when you trust Jesus, and when you put your faith in Jesus, he will change your life. He will transform your life in ways that you can't even imagine. Today, the pastor is going to talk about Saul and how his life was transformed. And I'm going to read the story to you from the children's Bible. It comes from the book of Acts, Acts 9, which is in the New Testament of the Bible. Listen. A bright light. There was once a very mean man, and his name was Saul. And he did not like anyone who loved Jesus. And he wanted to catch them, and he wanted to put them in jail. And he traveled near and far to find them. And one, on one of his trips, took him to the big city of Damascus. And while he was on his way, a bright light suddenly flashed from the sky, and it shone all around Saul. And Saul closed his eyes, and a voice called out, Saul, Saul, why are you doing this? And Saul was scared. Who are you? Saul asked. I am Jesus, said the voice. Now get up and go into the city. There you'll find out what to do. So Saul got up, but when he opened his eyes, he could not see, and his friends had to lead him to the city. And in that city, there was a good man, and his name was Ananias. And Jesus came to him in a dream and said, go, find Saul. So Ananias went to Saul. He touched Saul and said, Jesus sent me to, to you. Jesus wants you to be one of my friends. And right away, Saul opened his eyes and he could see. And he got up and he was baptized. And he was not mean anymore. And he even changed his name from Saul to Paul. And for the rest of his life, Paul told others about Jesus. When Saul met Jesus, his life changed. His life was transformed. Even his name changed from Saul to Paul. And no longer did Paul, Saul, travel from town to town to persecute Christians. Instead, he went from town to town to tell others about Jesus and about the faith that he had wanted to destroy. That's what a transformation can do in your lives, boys and girls. Let's pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, we want our lives to be transformed. We want to grow in our love for you. We want to grow in our understanding of you. Lord, be with the boys and girls. Bless them, guide them, and show them your will in their lives. And may they become all that you want them to be. We ask this in your dear son's name. Amen. Thank you, kids.
Thank you, Margo. Our sermon hymn is hymn number 174, Open Our Eyes, Lord. Let us now ask God to open our hearts and minds to hear God's word. Almighty God, through your only Son you overcame death and opened to us the gate of everlasting life. Grant that we who celebrate our Lord's resurrection may through the renewing power of your Spirit arise from the death of sin to the life of righteousness. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning is found in the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 9, beginning our reading at verse 1. Hear the word of God. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, Suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound, but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. In Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision. Ananias? Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, Go to the house of Judas on Straight Street 
and asked for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I've heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles and their kings and before the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord, Jesus, who appeared to you on the road to you, were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he could see again. He got up and was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our Lord remains forever. Amen. My name is Saul of Tarsus. I was called Saul of Tarsus because that is the place where I was born and raised. I was given the name of the first king of Israel. To summarize my life and early religious beliefs, I was circumcised on the eighth day, a member of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless, I was about as Jewish as anybody could be in the first century. And that's where my Jewish identity clashed with this belief called Christianity. Let me tell you the story of my conversion and how I became a witness to the resurrection. One of your authors once described my conversion in this way, I reckon that in order to make a Christian out of that one, we have to knock him off his horse. Now let me set the record straight. I was not traveling on horseback, but my mode of transportation was what some people call Shank's pony, my own two feet. Let me tell you about my experience on the road to Damascus. Before my conversion, I was a persecutor of the Christian church. I was public enemy number one of the Christian church. I sought to persecute those Christians. And I sought a search and destroy operation against these Christians. These Christians were leading an insurgency against the Jewish people and against the God of Israel. They were making countless charges and persecuting these Jews and accusing them of executing Jesus. They even claimed that this Jesus had been raised from the dead and that he was the long-expected Messiah, the Son of God. My first experience of the persecution of Christians came at the stoning of Stephen. 
I stood there and watched over their garments as they stoned Stephen to death. But as Stephen was being stoned, he attacked the Jews and accused we Jews of being opponents of God's will, of the God's spirit. He accused us of being traitors, murderers, violators of God's law. Well, at that time, I just felt that these Christians needed to be exterminated because of their blasphemy. And so with the cooperation of the local synagogues in Damascus, and with a letter of authority from the high priest, I planned with my companions to do a house-to-house search to seek them out and to bring them to Jerusalem for imprisonment. I look back in that part of my life with horror. I was the chief of sinners. But I'd rather not spend much time on my past. Well, as I was making my way to Damascus, suddenly I was surrounded by this blinding light which struck me. I was knocked to the ground. And I heard this voice say to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Could that be the voice of God? Some of my ancestors had been called by God with this double address. Abraham, Abraham. Jacob, Jacob. Moses, Moses. But I was puzzled by this question. Why are you persecuting me? So I cried out, Who are you, Lord? And the voice came back. I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. How can that be? This Jesus was supposed to be dead. But now he's speaking to me. That revelation caused me to undergo a complete transformation. I started to think of it differently. If this Jesus was speaking to me, then he was not dead. But he's alive. And now he was calling me not only to be a Christian and to change my life, but he was calling me to a new vocation, to be his follower, to testify to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Well, I was totally struck blind on that road to Damascus. I got up and I was totally disoriented. My companions had to take me by the hand and lead me into the city. I was blinded for three days. For three days, I didn't eat or drink. I was totally helpless. Well, the resurrection of Jesus Christ often brings about some interesting twists and turns in life. I was brought into Damascus and I was totally helpless. But I, the persecutor, was aided by one I'd come to persecute, a man named Ananias. This Ananias also had to undergo a resurrection of sorts. He had a vision. And in that vision, the same voice that has spoken to me on the road to Damascus spoke to him and said, Ananias. And he responded with the biblical, here I am. 
And then this voice told him about me. And to go to this house of Judas on Straight Street and to minister to me. But Ananias had heard of my reputation and knew that I was a persecutor of the church. And he cried out to God and said, how can you call me to go to this man who's persecuting your people? And then the voice told him, go. And then the bombshell hit. This Saul, to whom I send you, is no longer considered an enemy. But this Saul is going to be my instrument. This Saul is going to minister on my behalf to the Gentiles and to kings and to the children of Israel. He was now going to be my faithful witness. The one who had attacked my name will now bear my name. But he was also told something else. With all the suffering that I plan to inflict on these Christians in Damascus, now I would be the one suffering for the name of Jesus That's the story of Paul. But Paul also has more to say to us this morning. So let me tell you how to serve as a witness of Christ. After sometimes someone commits murder or a terrorist attack, the investigators will often do a psychological analysis of the killer. They might say that that killer was a loner, a sadistic writer, a person who had a bent toward violence. Well, that's not my story. I don't want you to do a psychoanalysis of my conversion. There is nothing in my past or my present that showed that I was struggling with my identity or even my religious beliefs. The voice of Jesus spoke to me, apart from my inner turmoil or my struggle. God approached me, encountered me through Jesus Christ and his servant, Ananias. That same Lord can encounter you too. I've often heard people giving credit to themselves for their conversion to Jesus Christ. My friends, conversion is a kind of radical change, a transformation of life that takes place completely that comes from Christ, and not something that we do. As God raised Jesus from the dead, so conversion is a gift. God, through his grace, was pleased to reveal his Son to me. Jesus said, you did not choose me, but I chose you. as you recognize your call to be a witness to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So let me remind you that conversion is a journey from self-control, independence, toward a childlike dependence. Before my conversion, I thought, I had it all together. I was on my way up in the religious life. But then I was struck blind on the road to Damascus. 
I was reduced to total dependence. Someone had to take me by the hand and lead me into the city. I was totally dependent upon others. I had to undergo death before I'd experience resurrection. I had to progress by regression and go forward by falling backward. This blindness, confusion, this speechlessness, this hunger and childlessness is the very beginning of wisdom. It's the resurrection to new life. New life takes place on the road to Damascus. And after I met with Ananias, my whole heart was filled with joy in God in Christ. I experienced a resurrection. It makes me delight in every kind of good as God wants me to. Some of you may feel bitterness toward another person. A bitterness that is dividing your relationships and affecting your relationships and affecting even the church. But when Ananias, somebody who helped me even though I despised the person initially, when that person reached out to me, and placed his hand upon me. And he cleared up my blindness and healed me and called me a brother, which was certainly a resurrection act, an act of grace. And when he had given me the Holy Spirit and fed me and given me the Lord's Supper, and enabled me to be a witness in the world, that too was transformational. As a previous enemy of the church, God transformed me from an enemy into a brother. God can transform you too. I believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. As I conclude my testimony this morning, let me leave you with these words. For it is the God who said, let light shine out of darkness that is shown in your hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Our gracious and heavenly Father, we thank you for the testimony of Paul. We thank you that you turned him from an enemy into your witness of the resurrection. And now we pray, Heavenly Father, that you will transform each and every one of us, that we may become effective witnesses of the gospel in our daily lives. Wherever you take us, wherever we go, May we witness to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And Lord, we pray that you will bring about that transformation of each and every person we meet and each and every person to whom we witness. And we pray this now in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us now rise and confess what we believe in the words of the Apostles' Creed and remain standing as we sing the praise song, Open the Eyes of My Heart. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, 
suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Lord, open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see Go out into the world in peace. Have courage. Hold on to what is good. Return no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. And help the suffering. Honor all people. Love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Alleluia! Amen.